Father, we thank you so very much, Lord, for the opportunity to just to preach your word and God, the opportunity to worship you here this day. God, I pray your blessing upon the preaching of your word. And God, I pray that you would honor all that is said. I pray that our hearts would be receptive. I pray that our minds would be attentive. Pray that our ears would listen. And I pray that we would receive the word of God as the word of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I guess I should also mention that Jerry and Keith both are also Southwestern Seminary. So uh, Southwestern rules the day here at Edmonds First Baptist Church. All right. Well, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 13. Joshua chapter 13. So please find your place there. Joshua chapter 13. We're going to do something pretty interesting this morning. We're going to look at Joshua 13 all the way through Joshua 19. Now, if uh, you know anything about those, ver- those chapters, you'll know that uh, basically it's just a lot of names. There, I mean, Joshua's dividing up the land. The different tribes are receiving their inheritance. And so what I want to do is I want to give you a structure for how the land is divided, but I'm not going to read all the verses. But there are some verses that we will look at. Now, the title of this morning's message is Beware of Pitfalls. Beware of Pitfalls. Now, what is a pitfall? A pitfall is a sudden or unexpected danger. Now, I grew up a country kid, and one of the things that we did for pastime is we played on the hay bales. We didn't have video games and all those type of things, and so our parents made us go outside and play. And we always loved it when all the round bells were put together because my cousins and I, we'd go out there and we'd play in the play hide and seek in the hay bales. We'd we'd get on top of the round bells and we'd run across the top trying to race each other. We'd build forts, all kinds of stuff. Now, if you weren't careful when you were running across the top of those hay bales, you would find a pitfall. I can't tell you how many times I would run across a hay bale and think that I had solid footing and step on the edge and fall all the way through the bottom. It was unexpected, and it could be quite dangerous. Now, the reason I'm entitling this message, Beware of Pitfalls, because, well, we need to be aware of pitfalls. There are unexpected dangers all around us as it relates to our spiritual walk with Christ. Now, we've all received an inheritance, indeed, if you are a Christian. The Bible says that our inheritance is the new birth, the divine nature. I read to you about that earlier. We have received an inheritance, a divine nature, a new birth. And part of our inheritance are all the blessings that come along with that new nature. What are they? Well, the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, Peace, patience, kindness, godliness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These attributes are all a part of our inheritance. They are the results of the divine nature. This is the abundant life. This is the life that Christ has given us. Christ has given us the abundant life now. And one day we will receive eternal life when Christ returns And we'll live upon new heaven and a new earth. But right now, think about this. Right now, indeed, if you are a Christian, God has given you a divine nature. And along with that nature comes all these wonderful attributes of love and joy and patience and kindness. This is our inheritance. And this is how we are to live our life while here on this planet. As we anticipate the second coming of Christ, the question is, how now shall we live? We're to live as people who have been born again. That means that we are to seize our inheritance. And we are to live our life in love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness. But here's the reality. 
is that there are many pitfalls in life that keep us from living that way. There's pitfalls that will rob you of your joy. There's pitfalls that will cause you not to love the way you should. There's pitfalls that will rob you of your peace and your patience and your kindness. And that will really make you ineffective as it relates to the kingdom of God. And so I want us to be aware of those pitfalls this morning. Now let's look at our passage. Really the book of Joshua is broken down into two, in, in one major division. As, as a matter of fact, when you look at Joshua chapters 1 through 12, uh, that, those chapters describe the nation of Israel coming into the promised land. Conquering the land. That's what we saw in Joshua chapters 1 through 12. When you get to Joshua chapter 13, you now move into the second half of the book. And the second half of the book is about dividing up the land. Now that you've conquered the land, this is how the land should be divided. As a matter of fact, if you're a regular Bible reader, most people when they come to chapters 13 through 19 skip over those chapters. Why? Because it's just like reading a genealogy. It's just name after name after name after name. Now, for example, when we look at this passage of Scripture, he first divides the land for the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They, they receive their land first. And that's found in chapter 13, verses 8 through 33. Then when you move into chapter 15, Judah is given... Or that tribe is given its land. And you see that in chapter 15, verses 1 through 63. Then Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh, in Joshua 16, they receive their land. Benjamin receives their land in chapter 18. Simeon receives his land in chapter 19. Zebulun receives his land also in chapter 19. Issachar also receives his land in Joshua 19. Naphtali, so too, receives his land in Joshua 19. And then ultimately the tribe of Dan. So when you work your way through chapter 13, all the way through chapter 19, it's just dividing up the land for all the tribes. Are you with me? However, as the land is being divided, you're going to notice that there are several pitfalls that we need to avoid. And I want to talk to you now about those pitfalls. The first pitfall is this. We need to beware of choosing to live on the border. Choosing to live on the border. And primarily, I'm talking about Reuben, Gad, in the half-tribe of Manasseh. If you know anything about these tribes, when they came to the promised land, they decided to stay on the west side of the Jordan. They did not want to cross the Jordan and receive the inheritance that God intended for them. Now, of course, they made a deal with Moses and then ultimately Joshua that they would help their tri other kinsmen clear out the land, but they did not want their inheritance in the land, in the promised land. God's will for them was to live on the west side of the Jordan, but they chose to live on the east side of the Jordan. Now, this proved to be a huge problem for them. Why? Because any time an attacking force would come against the nation of Israel in the land of promise, who would they first encounter? Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So basically those three tribes set out there exposed. Exposed to the enemy. Why? Because they were unwilling to go all the way into the land. Choosing to live on the border is a pitfall that we need to be aware of. The Bible talks about people like this. 
the author of Hebrews warns us. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, listen to these words. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still remains, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. This is what happened to these tribes. God says, this is the inheritance that I have for you. But yet those three tribes failed to reach it. Because they were unwilling to cross the Jordan. Now let me ask you a question. Who does this describe? It describes people who only want to go so far with Jesus, but they don't want to go all the way with Jesus. These are people who come to a certain point. They want salvation on their terms, but not on God's terms. These people are described in Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 4 through 6 when the author of Hebrews says this about them. They tasted the heavenly gift and shared the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance. Notice these are people who have only tasted the heavenly gift. They've only been partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've come so far, but they're not willing to go all the way. Jesus said this about himself. Jesus said, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, we'll live forever. There are some people who want to taste Christ, but they don't want to eat Christ, if you allow me to use those terms. Christ did. Listen, our world today, our Christianity itself, is full of false converts. People who claim to be followers of Christ, but who indeed are not saved. They've gone so far, but they're not willing to go all the way. Jesus said, I am the door if anyone enters by me. Notice Jesus says, I'm the bread. Whoever eats, that's consuming. That's going all the way. Jesus said, I'm the door. Whoever enters, listen, that's going all the way. It was the rich young ruler who failed to go all the way with Jesus. You remember what the rich young ruler asked of the Lord? He said to Christ, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, all these things I have kept, he said, from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, But yet you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. And then come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Make no mistake about it, the rich young ruler, he was willing to go to a certain point. But he wasn't willing to go all the way. I know this is where I was for many years in my life. At the age of nine, I came to the Lord and said, Lord, I'll go so far with you. But I'm not willing to go all the way. And I'm thankful to the grace of God on on April the 14th of the year 2000. The Lord did not let up convicting me. He drew me unto himself. He helped me to see the reality of my false profession of faith. And by the grace of God, on April the 14th, I went all the way with Jesus. I walked through the door. I consumed the bread. What about you this morning? When you look at your life, can you honestly say that you've gone all the way with Jesus? Jesus says, I have this inheritance for you. Eternal life, forgiveness of sin. This is the inheritance that I have for you. It's the divine nature. Have you truly received that? 
Or have you only, up to this point, have you only been willing to go so far? We must understand that we do not determine the terms of salvation. Christ does. I mean, for this reason, Christ said these words in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pastor. And Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. There are many, listen, many, who are willing to go to a certain point with Christ. But there are few who go all the way with Christ. There are many who gladly confess Jesus as Savior. But there are few who surrender to Him as Lord. Beware of that pitfall of choosing to live on the border. To only go so far, but being unwilling to go all the way. I plead with you this morning, if that describes you, I plead with you to go all the way with Jesus this morning. To confess with your mouth that He is Lord and to believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. I plead with you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Don't live on the wrong side of the Jordan. Many are comfortable with that, aren't they? Many are comfortable there. I can't tell you how many funerals I've done of people who have gone so far with Jesus, but they haven't gone all the way. And family members, they want to hang on to some type of glimmer of hope. Well, this person prayed a prayer when they were eight or nine. This is a, listen, this is a very true reality for me because I think about the death of my own father. My dad was willing to go only so far with Jesus. From my perspective, it didn't appear that he went all the way with Jesus. And I stand for you, before you today honestly saying, I do not know where my father is. He's either in heaven or he's in hell. And I don't know for sure where he's at. What about you? If you were to die today, do you have the assurance of where you would be? If not, you need to nail that down today. Cross over the Jordan. Fully surrender your life to Christ and be saved. The second pitfall we need to be aware of is having an inheritance but not possessing it. This was true for the nation They had an inheritance, but they didn't fully possess the inheritance. Uh, Look at chapter 13, verse 13. Yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Macathites. But Geshur and Macath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. God gave them the land. God gave them the the inheritance. But they did not fully possess the inheritance. As a matter of fact, look over at chapter 14, verse 12. So now give them... uh, That's the wrong one. Um, Look at chapter 16, verse 10. 16, verse 10. 
However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Notice that God gave these tribes their inheritance, but they did not fully possess the inheritance. Look at chapter 17, verse 13. Now the people of Israel grew strong, and they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not utterly drive them out. Look at chapter 18, verse 3. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long will you put off going to take possession of the land which the Lord your God of your fathers has given you? Notice, he's already given them the inheritance, but they haven't taken possession of it. This brings us to the second pitfall, and primarily, I'm talking to Christians at this moment. In my first point, I was talking about those who aren't sure of their salvation. Those who have only come so far, but they haven't gone all the way. But make no mistake mistake about it, when I come to pitfall number two, I'm talking to those who have truly been born again, and here's the Here's the pitfall we need to be aware of is having an inheritance but not possessing it. As as Christian people, we too, like the Israelites, must possess our possessions. (laughs) The idea of possessing that which is already given to us is a theme throughout Scripture. For example... Remember the verse that I shared with you earlier? Let's look at that verse again. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to these words and following. Here's our inheritance. Look here. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life. What an inheritance. All things pertaining to life and godliness. How do we receive this inheritance? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. By which He granted us, to us, His precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. There's your inheritance. You are partaker of the divine nature. You have been born again, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now notice this. You have an inheritance, but now you need to take possession of it. How do I do that? Verse 5. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. What's the virtue that he's talking about? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and patience. And kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. He says, add to your faith this virtue. God has given you an inheritance, now possess it. He's given you the divine nature. And with that divine nature comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That means that in you right now, you have love. In you right now, you have joy. In you right now, you have peace. In you right now, you have patience. In you right now, you have kindness. You have faithfulness. You have gentleness. You have self-control. And all the, listen, all those things that you have, you have in you right now. But you need to take possession of those things. So many Christians spend their lives praying for more joy. Lord, give me more joy. And I feel like the Lord may be saying in return, why don't you start possessing the joy I've already given you? And so many Christians are praying for more peace. And and I just believe I could hear the Lord saying, why don't you start possessing the peace I've already given you? And... Lord, give me more patience. Why don't you start possessing the patience I've already given you? Lord, more kindness. Why don't you start possessing the kindness that I've already given you? Lord, give me more goodness. Why don't you start possessing the goodness that I've already given you? Lord, help me to be more faithful. Why don't you start possessing the faithfulness that I've already given you? You get the idea? What does the scripture say? 
that he has given us all things pertaining to what? To life and godliness. He's already given it to you. Possess it. Live your life in light of it. He goes on to say, your faith virtue, and then add, and to your virtue, add knowledge. And knowledge, self-control. And self-control, steadfastness. And self, steadfastness, godliness. And godliness, brotherly affection. And brotherly affection, love. He says, now listen to this. For if these qualities are yours, and they are indeed if you're saved, if these qualities are yours, listen, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know whether or not I'm truly saved? Am I possessing the inheritance that God has already given me? He says, if you, are, if you possess these things, you claim these things, you walk in these things. I know it's a fight, but you keep fighting. You walk in these things. He says, they render you to be effective and not unfruitful. But if they are not increasing then they render you what? Ineffective and unfruitful. Would you beware, be aware, beware of that pitfall of having an inheritance but not possessing it? We are to live our lives abundantly in Christ. He has given us an inheritance and it's our job to possess their inheritance. We must drive out sin. We must drive out sin and we must walk in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit. Pitfall number three. Oh, you'll like this one. Thinking you're too old to begin a new conquest. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Now, Joshua was an old man. Don't you like how that starts? Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, Joshua was an old man, advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you're old. <laughs> and advanced in years. God even acknowledged it. God said, you're old and you're advanced in years. And there remains yet very much land for you to possess. I wonder how many God is saying that to this morning. Yeah, you're old and you're advanced in years, but I'm not done with you. There's still more that I want to do with your life. I had a pastor friend who said one time, he got tired of hearing church members say, well, I'm just too old. It's the younger people's responsibility. And he said, well, why don't we just pray for God to kill you then? I mean, if you're done, there's no need to hang around, right? If you're done, let's just get you on out of here. Now, I'm not saying that. But I, I'm just quoting, okay? What about Caleb? God said to Joshua, you're old, you're advanced in years, but, but there still remains a job for you to do. Now, look at chapter 14, verse 6. Talking about Caleb. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the Kenzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me the heart of the people melt, or he made the heart of the people melt. Look at what he says here. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. I gave it all to him. Verse 9. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever. Why? Because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. He went all the way. 
Verse 10. And now, but the, now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years, since the time that the Lord spoke to this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. It's believed that Joshua was 90-something. Caleb was 85. He said, I'm still as strong today as I was in that day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going out and coming in. So now, he doesn't say, let me retire. Look at what he says here. Does he say, now give me a place to retire? No, look at verse 12. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out as the Lord said. I mean, Caleb's still got some fight left in him. Caleb says, don't give me the plains, give me the hills. Give me the hard places. I've still got fight left in my bones. I I would say to you that this is a true pandemic in the age of Christianity. Oh, how many have fallen in this pitfall. I have heard in this church time and time again. I've heard people say, I've served my time. It's time for the younger people to step up. As if serving the Lord is a prison sentence. I've served my time. In the preceding chapter, we look and we see that Joshua, presumably at the age of 90, and then Caleb at the age of 85. But they were open. They were willing. They didn't think they were too old. And I would say to you, where do you stand on this issue? Have you said, I've done my time. It's time for the younger people to serve. Then you ought to repent. Because that is a sinful attitude. Thinking you're too old to begin a new conquest is a pitfall that many have fallen into. Could it be that God has a new conquest for you? Could it be that God still has something left for you to do? My prayer is that you would be open. Be open to what God may want to do in your life. God may want to start a new work in your life. God may want to start a new ministry in your life. God may want you to serve in this local church somehow, some way. I don't know. I'm just asking you. To stop thinking you're too old for God to use you. Pitfall number four. Making excuses for disobedience. We saw this earlier when we read through some of these chapters. And the Bible says they did not drive out the Canaanites. But what did they do? They put them to forced labor. What was God's will? That they drive them out. So it's like they made an excuse for their disobedience. Well, we need slaves. So instead of driving them out, let's just make them slaves. So really what they were doing is they were making excuses for their disobedience. Can we just all be honest and say that we've done that? Now, in light of recent controversy in the Southern Baptist Convention over plagiarism... (laughs) Let me quote to you from Rod Edmondson. (laughs) Rod Edmondson lists several excuses that Christians make on his blog. He says, for example, some Christians say, I can't. Your excuse is you don't have what it takes. Which also means you're not trusting God. Stop making excuses for your disobedience. Stop saying, I can't, as if you don't have what it takes. A second excuse is, I don't know how. These are people who think that the task is overwhelming, and therefore you may be too proud to ask for help. 
Really saying you don't know how is often an excuse that's really fueled by laziness. I can't. Well, I don't know how. The third excuse that people make is, I don't have time. Do you know what people are saying when they say they don't have time? Really what they're saying is that their life is compartmentalized with their time and God's time. And because of everything they want to do with their time, they don't have time for God. All the time that you have is God time. Every breath that you breathe is from the Lord. Every heartbeat is a gift to you by God Himself. Stop making excuses for your disobedience. Some people say, I'm alone. These are people who, leading out by faith, seems absolutely impossible. They can't see the forest for the trees when it comes to God's call on their life. And so they just say, well, I'm all all alone. I can't do this. God forbid that you'd ask for help. They would say, the task is too great. I can't do it by myself, so I'm just not going to do it at all. And then you have those that say, I'm afraid. So they use fear as an excuse for not obeying God instead of trusting the Lord. And then you have those who say, well, I can't afford it. You're afraid the dream will be more expensive than what God is able to provide. And then there's a, there, and really this is the issue. At the end of the day, it, there are those who say, I won't. You know, I've discovered a long time ago, do you know why Christians don't do certain things? It's because they don't want to. Now, they won't tell you that. They'll make excuses, but really at the end of the day, that's what it is. You don't do what you, what you should do because you don't want to. And so all I'm asking is, would you stop making excuses for your disobedience? That's a pitfall. That's going to keep you from living your life in light of your inheritance. The last pitfall of of this is being satisfied with half-hearted obedience. One is to make excuse for disobedience. The other is being satisfied with half-hearted obedience. Now, Caleb is a positive example. The Bible said that Caleb did what? He wholly followed the Lord. Several times it says that about Caleb. He wholly followed the Lord. Wholeheartedly means with all your heart. It is this idea that Jesus Christ embodied. Jesus himself said, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the basic of true discipleship. Is that you serve the Lord fully. Not half-heartedly. We have to come to a place where we realize that half-hearted obedience is disobedience. Serve the Lord with your whole heart. Seek excellence in all things. This is something that the staff and I constantly reiterate to each other. That whatever it is that the Lord leads us to do, we are to do it with excellence. That's the reason that every time we do something as a church... One of the first things that we do after we're done is we evaluate what we did. How could we do better? What do we need to do different next time? We pray, we plan, we implement, and then after we implement, we evaluate. Why? Because in all that we do, we want to give our, the Lord our whole heart. We want to do it with excellence. We don't want to give God our leftovers. I don't know about you, but I grew up as a boy, and we ate leftovers all the time, but I can't really stand leftovers anymore. So many of us are more than willing to give God our leftovers. And God doesn't want our leftovers. He wants our first fruit. So think about these pitfalls. Have you fallen into any of them? 
Have you chose to live on the border and not go all the way with Jesus? Are you guilty of having an inheritance but not possessing it? Or thinking you're too old to begin a new conquest? Or making excuses for your disobedience? Or being satisfied with giving the Lord half-hearted obedience? What should we walk away with today? We should walk away with the opposite of those things. We should go all the way with Jesus. We should take possession of what God has already gi- take possession of what God has already given you. There's no reason that you shouldn't be walking in the joy and the peace and the goodness and the kindness and the love of God. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Possess these virtues and let them increase in your life. Be ready for new conquest. Stop making excuses and give God your very best. He's worth it. He's given us an inheritance that we don't deserve. And we are to live our lives now in light of that inheritance. And as Jim Lee has always said, we are not to live beneath that inheritance. So go all the way. Take possession of what He's given you. Be ready to start new conquests. Stop making excuses. And determine today that you're going to give God your very best in all things. I learned how to avoid pitfalls when running on those hay bales. When When I was younger, I didn't think right. How many of you know that? And so I would run across those hay bales, and when I would jump, when I would see a gap in the bell, I would jump and I would aim, I would aim for the edge of the other bell. You know what happens when you aim for the edge? You fall. Then I learned, when you jump, don't aim for the edge Aim for the other side. And guess what? You'll land in the the middle. If you aim for the edge, you're going to fall every time. But if you aim for the other side, you're going to hit the middle. So many people today are happy with living on the edge of God's will. And what God wants you to do is to avoid the pitfall and aim for the other side so that you can live your life in the center of God's will. Stop living on the edge. Stop aiming for the edge. And start giving God your best. I'm going to ask if you would to bow your heads with me this morning in prayer. As always, we enter into a time of invitation. An opportunity for you to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You heard the plea this morning. Don't choose to live on the border. God's will for you is to cross the Jordan, to live on the west side, not the east side. (laughs) But you got to be willing to come to Christ and fully surrender your life to Him. So here in a moment when I ask you to stand, the invitation is for those to come who are ready to go all the way with Christ. Walk up to one of our pastors and let us pray with you. Maybe others of you this morning You just want to come and pray and say, Lord, help me to, I've been aiming for the edge. No more. I want to live in the center of your will. God, give me the grace and the help to do so. Maybe you're looking for a church home. And you want a church where you can trust that the word of God is going to be preached. And so maybe God's leading you to join our fellowship this morning. Then you come during this time of invitation. Or maybe you just need prayer. Come and let us pray for you. Father, we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You come now as the Lord leads.